when we left off, we were talking about cooling air masses, and this leads perfectly into fog. Let's clarify a few things before talking about fog. Radiation is energy transferred by radiating from the surface. So for example, if you have your stove on and you put your hand above it, that's radiation. The stove is radiating heat and you can feel it. And then there's conduction. If you touch the stove, heat is being transferred directly to you through direct contact. So that's conduction. And then convection is when molecules transfer energy. So if you have boiling water in a pot, the hot water molecules from the bottom of the pot rise up and then they sink back down as they cool and then rise and cool and rise and cool. And that's convection. Okay, so now fog. Radiation fog happens on clear, calm nights with little or no wind. The air stays warm but the ground cools off rapidly and it radiates that cold and it brings the air down to its dew point which causes fog. Now radiation fog happens with no wind and if there's any wind that will dissipate the fog. Also when the sun rises it will warm up the temperature and that can hold a lot more water, a lot more moisture and that will burn off the fog. Something else that's related to this is your shower mirror. You probably know that as you take a shower the mirror fogs up and the warm moist air when it gets to the mirror it condenses and forms water droplets. One fun way to clear up your mirror is actually to take a hair dryer and blow some hot air on those water droplets. And as we talked about earlier, when you heat up the air, it can hold a lot more water. So when you get the hair dryer going, that's hot air and it can hold a lot more water and so your steam will disappear off of your mirror. Advection fog happens when you take a warm, moist air mass and you move it over a cold surface. Advection means moving. So when you get winds up to 15 knots, that'll allow that fog to form and actually intensify. And you've probably seen this if you live on the coast somewhere, like in San Francisco. You get warm, moist air that comes in from the ocean, and as it moves over cold land, it'll get cold and you get advection fog. If you live in the mountains, you probably know about upslope fog. If you take moist, stable air and you force it up a sloping terrain, air cools and it reaches a dew point, and then you get fog. You also need wind for this fog to form, and it can last quite a bit actually, and it doesn't burn off when the sun comes up. I think the most awesome type of fog is steam fog. You take cold, dry air and you move it over warm water. The water will evaporate, it'll rise, and it will condense and resemble smoke. So you can see this either early in the morning or kind of late at night on the lake. When it's super cold, water can actually go from water into ice crystals and cause ice fog. It looks really cool, but if you fly through it, it's really dangerous because you become an ice particle immediately. For any visible moisture to form, like clouds, air has to reach its saturation point, or 100% relative humidity. And that's where that relative humidity term comes in. You also need some sort of particles for water to condense onto to make a water droplet. Those little particles are called condensation nuclei. The condensation nuclei can be smoke particles, or tiny dust particles, or salt. So like over the ocean there's a lot of salt evaporating so water droplets can form on the salt. If there aren't any of these particles for water to form, water can actually cool down to below freezing and not freeze because it has nothing to condense onto. If you happen to fly through some of this super cooled water, your airplane becomes a condensation nuclei and you freeze up immediately because that cold super cooled water is still water, but it's super cold, it's below freezing and it can freeze on your airplane. Super dangerous stuff. And just as a little note, if there's any visible moisture and the temperature is below freezing, you can expect to see ice. In other words, if there's fog or clouds and it's below zero Celsius, you can expect to have ice inside the clouds. We have a couple cloud types. They're low, middle, high, or clouds with vertical development. Low clouds are usually below 6,000 feet. Middle clouds are from 6 to 20,000. And then high clouds are above 20,000. And then clouds with vertical development are usually cumulus clouds that build into a towering cumulus or cumulonimbus and they build into thunderstorms because of convection or the up and down motion of moist, warm, unstable air. Cumulonimbus clouds have a lot of moisture and a lot of unstable air and they usually have things like hail, thunderstorms, lightning, wind shear and they're the most dangerous cloud. That's why on your METAR or your ATIS you'll see CB or cumulonimbus because that's something you want to avoid. Just as a fun little fact, the up and down drafts inside a cumulonimbus cloud can exceed 3,000 feet per minute, which as you know is really fast. When you think of clouds, you probably think of cumulus clouds. Those are those puffy clouds that look like somebody took a bunch of cotton balls and just stacked them together. Those are cumulus clouds. There's also stratus clouds and they're formed in layers, they're flat. And cirrus clouds are up high, they kind of look like stretched out cotton candy, they're nice and wispy. 
And anytime you see a Nimbus in the cloud name, like Cumulonimbus or Nimbus Stratus or something like that, Nimbus means rain, so that's a rain cloud. The most awesome looking of them all is a lenticular cloud. It happens over mountains when there is wind and when there's moist air. As the air gets forced over the mountain, it creates mountain waves. And as it goes up and down, up and down, at the top of that wave, you get lenticular clouds. As the air cools and reaches the saturation point, it forms like a lens looking cloud and it looks really awesome. But what it means is there's a lot of turbulence and a lot of strong winds and up and down drafts. On the METARs, I'm sure you've seen scattered clouds, few clouds, overcast clouds. What does that actually mean? If you take the sky above you and you divide it into eight equal pi sections, when you have one to two sections covered with clouds, that's called few. Three to four eighths is scattered. Broken is five to seven eighths. And then overcast is the entire sky above you is covered. Now a ceiling is the lowest layer of broken or overcast clouds. So for example, if you have scattered at 1500, few at 2000, broken at 3500, and scattered at 5000, what's the ceiling? A ceiling can also be vertical visibility up into fog or into haze. Because you can't determine what the ceiling is, it's not broken or overcast, it's fog. How far up you can see it can be considered a ceiling. And on the METAR you'll see that as VV or vertical visibility of however many feet. We get precipitation because water or ice particles in the cloud grow until the atmosphere can't support them anymore. They get too heavy and then fall down to the ground as rain or snow or ice. Something cool that can happen is called virga. And this is rain that falls but it evaporates before it gets to the ground. And so you have these cool looking streaks coming down from the cloud but never actually getting to the ground. Now let's kind of zoom out from a cloud perspective and look at bigger air mass picture. Air masses originate in different regions, and where they form, that gives them their characteristics, like temperature and moisture and dryness and things like that. And so, if you have an arctic air mass that forms over the polar region somewhere, usually it'll be cool and dry, but if you have a Pacific maritime air mass, for example, that will be warm, moist air that forms over the water. Moist, unstable air causes cumulus clouds, it causes showers, and it causes turbulence. If you take an air mass and move it over a colder surface, that doesn't cause convection, but that air mass becomes stable, and usually that means poor surface visibility. And that's because smoke and dust and other particles, they can't rise up and down and they get trapped close to the ground. Stable air masses produce low stratus clouds and fog. So you can tell that a stratus cloud usually means stable air and almost no turbulence, but cumulus clouds means unstable air and a lot of turbulence with ups and downs. When air masses run into other air masses that are different, they form a front, or a boundary layer between the two. When there's a front, the weather is always different on the other side of the front, and that's because it's a different air mass with different properties. We have a warm front, a cold front, a stationary, and an occluded front. And the front gets named based on the air that's coming in to replace the air that's currently there. For example, a warm front means that warmer air is coming. One important thing to point out Warm and cold don't refer to temperatures. Everything in weather is relative. So a warm front can be minus 20 degrees if it's replacing something that's minus 30 degrees. In a warm front, warm air advances and it replaces the colder air that's there. Warm fronts are typically slow moving at about 10 to 25 miles an hour. As the warm air comes in, it goes on top of the cold air that's there and it creates a nice little slope, slides over that cold air and eventually it pushes it out of the area. If you have warm air that has a lot of moisture and a lot of humidity, as it gets lifted on top of that cold air, the temperature drops, you get condensation, and you get precipitation. You can tell a warm front is coming if you look outside and you see cirrus or stratus clouds, and sometimes you even get fog. As the front approaches, you'll see stratus clouds, maybe possible drizzle or some rain. The visibility is typically poor, but as that front passes, it'll get better. After the front passes, you'll have stratus clouds, You'll have rain showers possible. Your visibility will improve, but it might be hazy for a little bit after that front passes. Now one front is fairly slow, so it might take a little while for that front to pass through. We have a nice little example in the P-Hack. In this example, you're flying towards a warm front. What you see in Pittsburgh is a high layer of scattered cirrus clouds at 15,000 feet. As you get to Columbus, you'll see lower clouds with more layered stratus clouds and a ceiling of about 6,000 feet or so. Visibility decreases to about 6 miles. And around Indianapolis, the weather deteriorates to broken at 2,000 feet and 3 miles visibility with rain. Past Indianapolis, the ceiling visibility is IFR. And if you were to get stuck in Indianapolis, 
it'd probably take a few days for that front to move and for the weather to improve. The cold front is kind of like a mean playground bully. It's cold and it's dense, it's stable, and it moves really fast, 25 to 30 miles an hour or so. It's kind of like a snowplow and it runs into the air at high speed and it forces it up really quickly. And that rapidly ascending air cools quick and it forms clouds. With a cold front prior to passage, you'll see cirrus or towering cumulus clouds or even cumulonimbus clouds. You'll most likely have rain in the area. As it passes, you'll have towering cumulus or cumulonimbus clouds and you will have heavy rain, lightning, thunder, hail, and that's because the cold air is shoving everything up and out of its way. You have a lot of updraft, a lot of up motion in the air, and all that air cools. It becomes rain, it becomes hail, it becomes all those things. And then you also have strong downdrafts as all that stuff comes back down to the ground. With a cold front, you can also expect poor visibility with all the precipitation and also gusty variable winds. Also, as the cold front passes, your temperature will drop because it is, after all, a cold front, and the pressure will fall rapidly. After the front passes, the clouds will dissipate into small little cumulus clouds, precipitation will start going away, the visibility will get better, and it'll stay cooler. If you have a fast-moving cold front, it could create a narrow band of weather in what we call squall lines. And that's a bunch of thunderstorms all in the same line, and it usually clears up rapidly, but while it's there, it's pretty violent weather. Looking at this example, if you're departing Pittsburgh, you'd see scattered clouds at about 3,500, 3 miles of visibility, and maybe a little bit of haze or smoke. Around Columbus, you'd see clouds with vertical development, and broken clouds at about 2,500 feet with 6 miles of visibility with a falling pressure. At Indianapolis, it would be overcast at 1,000, 3 miles of visibility, thunderstorms, and heavy rain showers. By the time you got to St. Louis, the weather would be a lot better with scattered clouds at 1,000 and 10 mile of visibility. So as a quick summary, cold fronts are fast and they bring violent weather. Warm fronts are slow, they bring low ceiling, poor visibilities, and rain. Cold fronts bring storm and gusty winds and turbulence, but they pass very quickly. Whereas warm fronts stick around, so you'll get the rain, the fog, the drizzle for maybe a couple days as it moves out of the area. Something to keep in mind and maybe look for, when you fly across a front or when a front passes, the weather will change. Things like temperature, moisture, stability, but most noticeably, the wind speed and the wind direction will change. A stationary front happens when you have a cold air mass and a warm air mass, and they have relatively the same force. One is not trying to shove the other one, and so they stay in the same area. And you usually have a mixture of both cold and warm front weather, and it kind of lingers for a while. An occluded front happens when you have a fast-moving cold front that catches up to a slow-moving warm front. And there are two types of occluded fronts. In the first type, you have cold air in front of warm air, and then the coldest air catches up to all three of them. So it pushes the warm air aloft on top of the cold air, and it pushes the cold front ahead of it. And the other type is cold air, warm air, and then cool air. So it's not as cold as the stuff in front of the warm air, but it's cooler than the warm air that's in the middle. So what happens is that cool air forces the warm air up, and itself it rides up on top of the cold air, so you have a lot of up motion going on. If the air is unstable, that will produce a lot of severe weather, like embedded thunderstorms, rain. I'm sure by now you're wondering how thunderstorms work. Thunderstorms have three different stages that make up the life cycle of the thunderstorm. We begin with the cumulus stage, and this is where unstable and moist air begins to rise up and increase the vertical height of that cloud. You have strong updrafts that prevent moisture from falling. So in the cumulus stage, you have mostly updrafts. When you get to the mature stage, that happens within about 15 minutes or so, the water drops get too heavy for the updrafts and they start falling down as rain or hail. And this is the most violent period in a thunderstorm is this mature stage. That's because you still have updrafts, but you also have downdrafts. Warm air is rising and cold moist air is falling. So there's lots of turbulence in and around the clouds. Once the motion at the top of the cloud slows down, when the updrafts kind of slow down, the top will spread out and it will make an anvil shape. You can tell which way the storm is moving by looking at the anvil top because the upper atmosphere winds will blow it in the direction that the wind is blowing. Finally, we get into the dissipating stage and this is where downdrafts spread out and replace all the updrafts and the storm can't sustain itself anymore. Some of the things that can happen in a thunderstorm, obviously turbulence, and you can get that all the way up to about 20 miles away or so. You can also have a gust front when the mature stage starts, when you have the downdrafts. Obviously, you can have wind shear, and then when the thunderstorm starts dissipating, you can get those microbursts that we talked about that are super unhealthy and bad. Don't fly through them. 
there's a really good chance for icing, there's a lot of moisture in the air, and the water can reach a freezing level really quickly, and you can even get super cold water droplets that make your aircraft become that condensation nuclei I mentioned earlier. A good rule of thumb once again is anything below zero degrees with visible moisture there's a potential for icing. Some notes about thunderstorms, don't try to fly over them. They can go as high as 50, 60,000 feet. If you ever have to fly around the thunderstorm, stay at least 20 miles away. At least. I'd go a little bit more. Some of the turbulence and hail can get tossed way outside of the clouds. And you can get turbulence thousands of feet above the thunderstorm as well. Just because you're not in a cloud doesn't mean the air isn't moving. I mentioned a squall line earlier, and a squall line is a band or a line of thunderstorms. Sometimes it can be long, it's usually narrow, but it can be long and you might not be able to go around it. And usually it's associated with a fast moving cold front. Some people wonder what happens if you get hit by lightning. Usually nothing happens, because an airplane is built like a Faraday cage, and if you know anything about that, basically if there's any sort of energy input on the Faraday cage, it will flow through the entire structure of the airplane and it will flow out to the static wicks at the tail or on the wings. So that's why you pre-flight those and make sure they're on the airplane before you go flying. But the worst thing that lightning can do is probably blind you. And you might not know, but an average jet airplane gets hit about once a year by lightning. So that's basically it for weather. I know there's a lot more information and weather theory is constantly evolving. So look it up yourself if you want to know more. And until next time, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time. <music>